looks like we have a quorum and we're just waiting for Jerry. Sam, did you get feedback on whether Jerry was planning to attend? Jerry Poor? I didn't hear anything on that. Hi, this is Craig. Uh, Jerry printed a copy of the agenda for me and delivered it to me today, so I'm pretty sure she's going to attend. Oh, okay. Well, we'll hold on for a few minutes then. All right, we're recording. All right. Good evening and welcome to the April 21st, 2022 Open Space Conservancy Trust video meeting. I'm Tom Hildebrandt, Chair of the Open Space Conservancy Trust Board, and we're meeting in accordance with Proclamation 2028.10 of the Governor's Extended Safe Start Order. Tonight's meeting is being recorded on video using Zoom technology and will be made available through the city website tomorrow. Deputy Public Works Director Elaine Summergren, Parks Operations Manager Sam Harb, Natural Resources Project Coordinator Lizzie Stone, and Trails Urban Forestry Specialist Andrew Prince are participating in tonight's meeting. Uh, bear in mind that other people may be listening in that aren't shown on the screen, and uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. Uh, Sam, would you like to call the, the roll? Yeah, Chair Hildebrand. Here. Vice Chair Bursa. Here. Secretary Poor. Here. Trustee Bender. Sorry, here. <laughs> Trustee Olson. Here. Council Liaison Andrew. Here. Trustee Ette? Here. All righty. Uh, the first, oh, let's see. Um, do we have any appearances this evening? We do not. Yeah. All right. Since there are no appearances, we can move on to the regular agenda. First item on the agenda is approval of minutes from past meetings. So uh, considering first the November meeting, are there any comments and corrections to the meetings that were the, um, the minutes that were published for the, the November 3rd meeting? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'd like a motion to approve the minutes. So move. Second. Okay. I'm sorry, did you second that, Craig? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, then uh, with a show of hands and verbally saying, I uh, indicate that you approve the minutes. Aye. Aye. Uh, any people opposed? Okay, those minutes are approved. So we move on to the minutes from the January 20th meeting. Are there any comments or corrections on those minutes? Very well. Uh, yes, Marie, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Marie, you're muted still. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, on paragraph two, it seems that the words that might be missing have been repeated twice. So it's just a little typo. Okay, um, start again, please, because we didn't hear all of that. So the last sentence of paragraph two, the words might be missing, that might be missing are in the sentence twice. Okay. 
It mentions that the trail portion of the report might be missing a section of the ravine trail. I would then I put a semicolon in there and just delete that might be missing as that's a duplication. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay, with that amendment, uh, can I have a motion for approval of the minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second. Okay, I hear a motion and second. All in favor, raise a hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. So we've approved the, the minutes from our past meetings. Uh, Next item on the agenda is uh, we'll be hearing about the restoration work plan. And uh, would that be you, Sam, that's going to take that? Or? No, it's going to be Lizzie. Hi. Okay. Turn on my camera here. Very good. All right. So um, I. Most of this information is shared in the staff report, but I'm going to share my screen and go through a quick slideshow okay. that represents it. Can y'all hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Good. Thanks. We're confirming. Okay. And can you see my pretty Grand Canyon view screen? Yep. Excellent. Um. Just a second. Hi, I'm, I'm in a meeting. I think you might be the last person. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, let me just move my windows around here so I can actually see y'all. Okay. Are y'all able to see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so what I am doing here is reporting to the trust board, which is something that the city city staff does every year um, on our planned forest restoration activities for um, Pioneer Park and Engstrom open space. And just a reminder that these forest management activities are guided by the forest or Pioneer Park um, forest health plan and the 10 year update to our open space vegetation management plan on the city. So these restoration activities are being done by hired professional contractors, also our seasonal crew, um, some natural resources staff are doing some of this as well as volunteers. And a note on our volunteer programming for 2022, um, due to some increased costs and changes in capacity, various programmatic changes with our volunteer partners that we've worked with in the past, um, our, the natural resources team has decided to hire a seasonal volunteer coordinator that we'll have in-house. So that person will be leading regular restoration and trails volunteer events throughout the island and specifically focusing on trust property and, and planning to have quite a, or many more than the last few years at least <laughs> events on trust property this year. So I'm pretty excited about bringing this person on to help build up our volunteer program, um, re-engage forest stewards and hopefully engage new forest stewards and bring a lot of volunteers out to do some restoration and trails work in our trust properties and other parks. Um, so in 2022, our contractors are scheduled to work in two quadrants, the Northeast and Southeast quadrants. Um, and you may remember that after some contract bidding challenges and wildly increased costs, um, that we saw in 2021, we, um, had to delay the start of our comprehensive invasive removal, or at least the removal of ground ivy and herbaceous weeds that was outlined in the Pioneer Park Forest Health Plan um, for that year. So in 2022, we will be um, in both taking care, caring for our recent plantings that we put in last year, but also um, launching our comprehensive invasive weed removal efforts in Pioneer Park Northeast and Southeast. Lizzie, um, I just want to mention, I'm not sure if your slides should be advancing. They are not. They're not screen. yet. I just am talking okay. a lot right. on the first slide. <laughs> uh, there's only like four slides, so there's going to be a lot of meat within each one. Um, but thank you. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit for going into each quadrant. Um, 
but yeah, so basically was just trying to point out that we are going to be um, starting our comprehensive removal or invasive removal in our um, uh, in two of the quadrants this year, um, which will start in late May and continue through the end of the summer. Um, we did already have our restoration crew start. They've already started doing a lot of work in the park. I'll talk about that once we get to each quadrant um, and they'll continue to do work throughout as well. So going um, quadrant by quadrant. Um, in the Northwest quadrant, we don't have any contracted work this year, but we will be having um, the natural resources crew going out and doing some monitoring and control of yellow archangel that we have found uh, populations of it up in the north border of the um, northwest quadrant. So they'll be checking out those spots and managing it. Um, they will also be doing planting maintenance of um, two areas that were planted in 2020. Um, they're nearly invisible green circles here and here. Um, those are relatively new plants. So we're going to be going in and mulching around them, making sure that they're not being overtaken by weeds. Um, generally maintaining those plants. And then also they will be working on um, the parking area restoration along 84th um, Avenue, which we had done a pilot project for in 2021, um, as you y'all may remember. Um, so they will be helping the natural resource staff to make that restoration effort more permanent and prevent folks from parking up on into the park and extending that parking area. So the crew will be largely involved in that. Also, there will be a lot of volunteer stewardship happening in Pioneer Park Northwest um, this year. They will be working along the perimeters in these blue areas that I have um, highlighted here, which is which are areas where volunteers have worked in the past, um, previously with Earth Corps. So we want to continue that volunteer effort of maintaining those areas. Um, and it, it's possible that there will be additional projects more in the interior the, or interior of the park, but we will start with. Um, continuing some of the previous volunteer work around the boundaries. All right, so Pioneer Park Northeast in the Northeast quadrant, um, we have planting maintenance um, from contractors and also watering that's gonna be happening um, for some of the plants that were put in in 2021. So we have about 600 plants that were put in in this blue area here. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be making sure that those don't get swallowed up by weeds and keeping those trees and shrubs alive, make sure that they're healthy um, with the help of some contractors. We will also be um, starting comprehensive invasive removal in um, this yellow area here. So mm -hmm. there has previously already been comprehensive um, invasive removal here in this area. Can y'all see my mouse? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So this area has been um, cleared of invasive weeds and is in the maintenance cycle now, as well as a large section of this area over here. So this um, this comprehensive work will be kind of bridging that gap and creating a more continuous um, managed area. So we hope to be able to continue and spread that around so it's a larger block of the park over time. Um, the natural resource crew will be doing noxious weeds monitoring throughout this quadrant. They also have already started um, and done made pretty good headway to start um, on ivy rings along the ravine trail. I don't know if anyone's noticed, um, but they've been out there um, getting very familiar with some of these big trees that are being swallowed up by ivy. Um, they will also be doing some planting maintenance in this green area up here that's sort of mm -hmm. a ravine. And we have some older plants that were put in that they'll be going out and re-flagging them, making sure they're really visible, clearing around them and putting some more mulch around the base to make sure that those, those plantings survive. Um, as far as volunteer stewardship projects, we don't have specific projects that are, that are slotted for this quadrant, um, but that is not to say that we won't. Um, I'm open to suggestions and ideas and also I think it's kind of depends on what our volunteer schedule is, whether we have any board members or forest stewards that are interested in trying to work in a specific area. So there's sort of TBD, but we're, I'm super open to there being a volunteer stewardship effort in sections of, of the Northeast quadrant. Now headed south to the Southeast quadrant, we have comprehensive invasive removal, um, which I realize I maybe didn't describe what that actually means. Um, so that includes ivy rings 
Um, it also enc encompasses planting maintenance. So clearing weeds from around plants that were put in in the past. It also includes invasive tree treatment in these areas, as well as removing ground ivy and herbaceous weeds. So it is moving forward a lot of our um, activities that are outlined in the forest health plans work plan. Um, and I will say also that the benchmarks that were outlined in that plan, um, we're, we're not going to get as far as we would like to be by the 2022, as uh, according to the work plan. Um, and that is just simply due to seriously increased costs of contracted restoration work. And um, also just that these, the longer these areas sit um, and invasive weeds take hold, the more complicated and complex the work gets. So it then compounds and get even gets even more expensive. So it's just kind of the reality of this moment. And we are getting as much work as can uh, as we can done with the resources that we have. And I'm really excited that we are going to be starting on this um, on this comprehensive invasive removal path um, and reclaiming these areas from the ivy. Because if you've been out there lately, you know that the ivy has really, really taken hold. Um, so as for the crew, the crew will be out. There's a lot of um, noxious weed monitoring and management that needs to happen in the southeast quadrant. There, are these um, yellow square, or sorry, um, pink squares that are on the map here are locations where we have seen spotted jewelweed in the past. So within the next couple of weeks, they're going to be out looking for that and digging it up where they find it. Um, we've also seen knotweed um, on this in this quadrant, we've seen um, shiny geranium and yellow arch archangel. So there's gonna be doing a lot of surveying and management. Um, I will say that for um, shiny geranium, we did have a representative from King County Noxious Weeds go out and look. And apparently our management in the past has been very successful. So he was able to dig up just a couple of plants and it seems like we've got a good handle on that um, infestation of shiny geranium in the park. So that's pretty good news. Hopefully we see that um, with the other weeds that we are looking for throughout the summer. And then similar story as the Northeast Quadrant, we don't have specific volunteer projects out um, on the, in the lineup yet, um, but I'm really interested and excited about the possibility of having volunteer projects in the Southeast Quadrant this year as well. Um, so that will be an open conversation and sort of a fluid schedule that we will be figuring out over the coming couple months. And then as for Ingstrom, um, we don't have any contracted work happening here, but we will be doing noxious weeds monitoring and keeping an eye out um, throughout the park. We have in following the ravine trail already done some um, ivy rings on some trees that were missed in years past and also some trees along the Pioneer Park edge that really needed those ivy rings. So I'm excited that we were able to get out and do those and we'll continue that and some planting maintenance throughout Ingstrom um, throughout the year with the natural resources crew. And that is all of my new information for you. So I'm gonna open it up to any questions that y'all have about our restoration plan. Yes, uh, Geraldine. Oops, I don't know if Geraldine's trying to talk, but I can't hear anything yet. All right, let's try it again. Sorry. <laughs> um, I wondered if we could dig in a little bit to the first page of the staff report and the, you referred to it also in our discussion, but the discrepancy between what was in the budget or what was in the plan of 15 and a half additional acres per year yeah. versus what's able to be done. And you wrote, or it was written, I think you wrote, uh, that yeah. that was due to contracting costs and increasing complexity. And I was wanted to ask a question about when the plan was developed, which Lizzie, you may not have been here, but what was the 15 and a half hours based on you know, an aspiration or a, was it a certain budget? How, how was that number come up? How was it that that number came about? That is a good question. I was not here yet. Um, 
I, from looking at the plan, oh good, Elaine's face is back. She might know the answer to that better. <laughs> um, there are budget numbers associated with it that don't reflect the reality of this moment. So I think that there was at least some budget consideration put into that 15 and a half acres um, and trying to think about how we can possibly accomplish all of this in a given timeline and what do we got to do, need to do each year in order to do that. Um, but Elaine, do you want to uh, expand on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. For the record, Elaine Summergren, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Lizzie, can I ask you to uh, stop screen sharing and uh -huh. we can look at everyone's faces for a discussion? Great, thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. Um, so yes, the 15 and a half acres, like Lizzie was saying, was really based on um, trying to get through this work in a timely fashion, but it was also based on the current numbers at the time, the unit cost per, essentially, I believe it was per square foot was what we were calculating it on, but it had to be based on those current costs. Those were the ones we had been working with that reflected the current bids for comprehensive invasive removal. Now, granted, this was in 2008. These were very different times. Um, a couple things to note about the prices that were set in 2008 one, we were, we were getting into a recession. And so um, we were getting a little bit farther with the money that we had then when that plan was being crafted. Um, and in addition, uh, I will note that restoration work has become far more mainstream for a lot of municipalities. And so there are a lot, of, a lot more demands on the limited number of contractors that do restoration work and do it well in the area. Um, and so they're just in great, you know, much higher demand. And then just, of course, inflation over time, um, some of which was factored in, but clearly not enough to reflect all of those changes in the field. Can I just close? Uh thought my question. Uh, so um, I think I was rather than trying to understand the discrepancy, I was trying to think about where we will be going and what the implications will be if we continue, if it is only able, if we're only able to fund it at half the rate, what that means um, for the future. Um, and that's something for us to think about, I think. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, we will yeah just be moving a lot more slowly with uh managing comprehensively managing those invasive weeds in the on these sites and um i do hope that we can um also be maybe having like some forest steward type of role that is trying to chip away at this effort as well i will say that a lot of this work is um, pretty technical and um, is a lot to ask of volunteers. It could be on steep slopes mm -hmm. and things like this are really not appropriate for volunteers, but um, in the areas where we can, I would love to be able to see if we can move forward with some of that and as to supplement the work that we're able to contract out. But the reality is it's just going to need to move, move more slowly and we'll try to continue to do a good job in the areas we are working and progress it as we can. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, and Council Member Andrew has a hand raised. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I was just looking at the map and I'm seeing like that on the, some of the invasives are kind of broadly spread out, but some of them are like just in one or two spots, like the knotweed or the, um, the yellow one. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, what are the chances of actual eradication? on any of these plants. I'm just kind of curious from a, you know, process standpoint. I mean, is, it, is there any way to put some of this stuff in our in the rearview mirror forever or is it a constant battle? Good question. Um, this, I mean, as for, like I mentioned this, the shiny geranium that we have found in the park before um, that was treated in 2021. And it looks like it was a small focused population that we have been able to get a handle on. So we will always be needing to continue to look through like survey and keep an eye out for these, especially, I mean, there are a lot of trails through the park. Those are areas where people's feet are transfer, you know, bringing in seeds and there's disturbance that happens. So there will always be potential for new infector like infestations. And it seems like we likely caught that shiny geranium early enough that it didn't set a lot of seed. 
And mm -hmm. it seems like we were able to gotta get a handle on that infestation. Same goes, I mean, knotweed is all around the island and all around the greater area. It is not gonna be something that we cannot think about anymore, um, but it is something that we can manage. And the population, uh, the small dots that we had in Pioneer Park last year, we didn't. We only found one stem of knotweed. So if that's the case, then we are gonna be able to get a handle on it, which isn't to say it's in the rear view mirror, but it's not something that's taking a ton of staff time and needing to use herbicides in the park or anything. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Um, could you touch briefly on the methods that are used for the species that you mentioned? I think we're aware that IV just gets pulled out for by the by rings and the, but um, I'm not familiar, for example, with how the uh, jewel weed is treated. Yeah, so um, our spotted jewel weed, we'd end up actually just digging that one out. It really depends on the plant. Um, it depends on the plant and um, we in Pioneer Park are bound by the herbicide use protocol that exists. So um, that that limits our ability to manage things in other ways. But with ivy, yeah, you're totally right. We we pull that by hand. We pull it away from the base of the tree of plants. We remove it by hand. Blackberry, we dig it out. Um, and in other parks, we are able to um, it, when it's very close to native plants growing, um, where it's going to cause more damage to the native ecosystem than it is um, to dig it than it is to cut it and dab a tiny bit of herbicide on it. We will use that approach, but actually we don't do that in Pioneer because that's not included in our herbicide use protocol. So just manual management of blackberry. Um, not weed, we do, that one is an aggressive weed that is very difficult, basically impossible to manage um, without some form of herbicide. So that one we do, if it's a large enough stem, we will inject it. And if it's a small single plant, then we will um, do a concentrated focused spray of herbicide. Um, as for shiny geranium, if it's just a few plants, you can dig them out. Um, there's also herbicide management that can happen and that is not currently included in the herbicide use protocol. So um, we dig it out. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember. Then um, the, the woody species, uh, oh. you use the, uh, the injected herbicide in yeah. those. Um, and then, um, yeah. Um, then is the yellow archangel just dug? Is that the way you remove that? That could go both ways. It can be, if it's a really big infestation, we will use an herbicide treatment for that. And if it's a small one, I would, I prefer to do manual methods if they're effective and going to be, if, and we can. So we can do, do that with small infestations um, as long as we're really diligent about coming back and looking for it. If it's a larger one, we will need to use an herbicide to be actually, actually able to control it. And I will say, um, I remember actually from last year, I think probably the first presentation I gave to the trust board, um, we talked about herbicide use um, and someone, maybe you um, made note that, or asked that we um, let land or neighboring landowners know if we are gonna be treating yellow archangel or if we do see those populations. And that weed does tend to be an escapee from gardens. So I am fully in support of that and happy to do so. Um, if we are gonna, if we're noticing it on a property boundary, letting those landowners know and also informing them if, if on the park side, we are gonna be using any herbicide. Um, there will of course be signage put out in accordance with the law and everything, but we can also let those land, those homeowners know ahead of time. Yep, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, is there any, oh, um, I see Maria, you have your hand raised, so. Yeah, um, so. Uh, you know, all weeds are a problem, but the one I worry most about is the ivy. Uh, are we making progress or are we losing ground? That's a good question. Um, I haven't been uh, working on the island long enough to be able to say that for, with a lot of context. <laughs> um, I will say that we are trying to be focused with our ma ivy management where one of the big issues with ivy is when it, there are a few big issues. A really big one is when it grows up trees and creates a like weights down the trees, could rot them out. It could cause all kinds of issues and it's flowering and seeding once it gets up high like that. So 
by using, like focusing our efforts, efforts on creating ivy rings. We are, I mean, those are a pretty effective tool at protecting those trees and preserving our canopy. Um, as far as clearing it on the ground, um, we're, it seems to me like there is progress being made, but also I can't say that with the context of what it looked like 10 years ago. So hard to say. <laughs> so I guess the other thing is, is, as usual, one of our comments is there's not enough money. Um, is there a way to sort of, I mean, it's great to tell us that, but how was the city council and the parks and rec commission being informed? Do they get copies of these reports? Is, I mean, how do we say we too need more money? That's a great question. And I can't speak to that very well. <laughs> uh, I, I make the budget with what I'm given. I haven't been the one to advocate a lot for it. So hopefully um, Elaine can help with that question. I can, I can certainly speak to it somewhat. Um, so I, I think that uh, there are a couple different avenues for this. Um, certainly remember that um, this work you know, all of the open space vegetation management work, both in our larger open, you know, other open spaces, as well as the trust properties um, were memorialized in the pros plan as, as you know, a, a CIP project going forward. So um, there is a recognition that this is, you know, this is a high priority um, for the city and for the residents. Um, and the context with which it's also, you know, in, um, in, in a space with a lot of limited dollars for a lot of parks needs. And so I think it's really about, you know, finding out where the balance is there with a lot of our, our aging infrastructure needs in parks, uh, because those do tap into a lot of the same funds. Um, I will say one avenue for communicating to council about this is the trust's annual report. And so um, that's that's one way that this sort of information can be hap captured and transmitted to the council. So um, certainly, you know, when uh, the trust is presented with the draft of that report, you can certainly ask us to be, you know, really focusing on certain aspects mm -hmm. of, you know, challenges that are being faced um, on trust properties, and that can be reflected in the report also. So that just to remind you that, you know, you don't, you don't need to take exactly what we write to you. you. You can certainly, you know, craft it in a way that really reflects where your priorities are and what sort of message you'd like to get across to council. Yes, Carol. Yeah, so I guess I want to circle back and it was uh, uh, Geraldine that raised the issue, but uh, I think it incorporates some of the comments that uh, Marie has raised and that um, um, is there a need perhaps to figure out what the right number is, uh, rather than uh, letting this be driven by, uh, you know, monetary issues I understand I understand we do have monetary issues, but, um, you know, how did we get to the 15 is that the right number for today. Because my concern is, much as Marie's, you know, even though we're going slower, <laughs> um, you know, and I understand you're doing what you can with the dollars that you have, but if we are going slower, um, are we going slower toward the right goal? Um, and are we getting behind? And I don't, you know, and I understand we may not have the answers to any of that right now, but maybe there's a need to kind of regroup here and figure out, you know, what is the true number? You know, what's the true target? Um, and that would certainly strengthen, you know, any communication that we want to make take forward, um, because I think we have to bring something stronger than, um, well, these are the dollars and, you know, it costs more now. Um, I, I think we just need a firmer grasp of, you know, what the true target is and um, are we, how far away are we from it? Well, we do have the Ford forest management plan as a benchmark and um, the, the report that we got this evening was that we we're falling behind with respect yeah, to exactly. that, that benchmark. So um, we might want to try to turn that uh, benchmark into a dollar amount and, yeah. um, and say that there's a definite need for increasing the budget. 
one of the things that I, I want to bring up just for context with the, you know, the forest health plan is that when it was, when it was written, when, when I wrote it with, uh, with Ben Peterson back in 2008, and it was adopted in early 2009, um, it, it's a 20 year plan. And we are currently in, what is it, year, year 14 of this. Um, we had, we had a 10 year data collection done, right? We had some survey work done on vegetation 10 years into the plan to find out where are we on this, right? Are we, are we on track? Are we behind schedule? There's certainly the schedule that was set out in terms of benchmarks for acreage to get done, but I think there's also meaningful data there about, um, you know, just what is, what does forest health look like? I think this is an interesting time in that 20 year cycle though, because this is really when things get heavy, right? I mean, there were a lot of really discrete tasks that were laid out in a very particular order in, in the forest health plan. And they were really about prioritizing sort of how do we get the most bang for our buck ecologically while we're trying to turn this forest over time. Um, and like Lizzie was noting, you know, one of those things was ivy rings because one of the highest priorities in the forest health plan was preserving canopy trees, right? We have a lot of challenges with canopy trees in uh, across the island, but particularly in Pioneer Park where we see a higher incidence of, of root rot diseases that are taking down, you know, mature trees. And so that was a really high priority, right? And then one of the other really high priorities was getting out invasive trees so that we would have less competition for young trees that we were really trying to get a new cohort or several cohorts of, of young conifers coming up in the forest. Um, but, but right now, you know, as we, as we start to transition into this, um, the more comprehensive removal, you know, this has always been clear that this is this is the heavyweight, right? Like this is sort of the last big push in forest health for Pioneer. Mm -hmm. And we always knew this was gonna be the heaviest lift of, of this whole process. Um, I will say, I don't, I don't find it particularly um, uh, surprising maybe that this is so expensive like lizzie was saying this is really technical work it's very um mm -hmm. for lack of a better term maybe it's really nitpicky work right i mean it's really going in and and pulling out you know primarily ivy from established plantings which is just really labor intensive um, particularly when you're not using herbicides in a widespread way right you're using manual labor so um you know, I think I think Lizzie's been doing just a great job of kind of you know keeping the larger context of where is the priority in terms of forest health, right? And and not losing track, you know, regardless of what the plan says of what's actually going on in the forest. And if she needs to reprioritize what work is being done, you know, saying, well, the plan calls for one year of planting maintenance, but it's very clear that this needs two years of planting maintenance. So there has to be some room in the execution of that plan for adjusting as needed. And sometimes that's a trade-off with our dollars, right? Maybe, you know, one of the things that wasn't accounted for in the plan was um, really the acceleration of changing climate and how that affects our new plantings and that a lot of the soils in Pioneer Park and Angstrom open space are very well drained and that we actually now need to pay for watering contracts. We, that was not figured into the 20 year plan and that's very expensive work, um, but it really does pay off to have those young plantings get through that first year mm -hmm. or those first two years. So it's just a couple of considerations that um, it, it's not entirely just about uh, you know, sort of losing ground on comprehensive because we've known this is, like I said, sort of the big final push on forest health. So, and making those big changes. Thanks for that background. Um, it, um, would it be 
would be something that the, a board member could take on to uh, to look at the, the forest management plan and where we are mm -hmm. and um, attempt to to uh, provide a, a value for that, or would you like to keep that in sort of as a staff uh, task to to suggest uh, the um, ideal budget at a at a future meeting? Actually, um, probably makes better sense to keep that as a, a staff task because you have access to the information on um, what uh, labor rates are and, and such like. Yeah, um, my first thought of um, uh, hearing that question is that, um, while of course we are tracking our own benchmarks and where we are, um, it, the process of pulling that all together in a way that and and communicating it to a board member and also incorporating the current um unit costs of restoration and trying to talk or trans uh, i guess it seems like maybe delegating that task to someone else would be more um effort than it would be for me to just do that <laughs> All right. so um, uh, yeah so in in reference to that discussion uh, i think it would be a good idea for you to carry that in mind as we uh, go through the course of the year and uh, as a as a task that you may be uh, called on to to produce a, a realistic number for keeping on schedule with our our maintenance um, our our maintenance plans um, so that we could tender that uh, to the city council next year. So that's one one way we can proceed with this, and I think we're all in favor of uh, using volunteer effort as much as possible to fill in with that. So um, I applaud the hiring of the the volunteer coordinator, and, and look forward to hearing how that's working out. Um, I, Tom, I'm, yes, I'd like to interject just just one more thought because I, I heard someone mention it was um, this question about, you know, what do we, what do we lose when the execution of comprehensive removal gets drawn out longer yeah. than was originally planned for? Um, and do, do, does that have, uh, you know, does that have consequences or maybe what are the consequences of drawing that out? And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, as staff, you know, Lizzie and, and Sam and I could work on speaking to that a little bit, you know, based on the current costs and sort of maybe what's realistic in terms of how long does that get attenuated at the current rate, you know, are we talking about an additional 10 years? Are we talking about five years? Just to give the trust board maybe some, some larger context about what that looks like rather than, you know, solely maybe the only option being we're gonna try and cram it into the original schedule. Just as, just as a, maybe an alternate to look at. Yes, yes, looking at, what the consequences are if if the uh, if our plans or original goals are not met, how well we can make do on a smaller budget. So yes, that that context would be very useful. So um, we've heard the restoration work plan and uh, discussed the. Uh, issues with it. Um, so at this point, I believe we uh, are just uh, obliged to accept the plan unless there's further discussion. So uh, do I do I hear a motion? For a motion? To uh, approve the 2022 restoration work plan. 
Thank you. And do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Oh, thank you. All right. All those in favor, please raise a hand and say aye. 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 And anyone opposed? Hearing none, the work plan is accepted. Um, so thank you for your presentation, Lucy. And we'll move on to the uh, fire management plan review. So we have uh, Jeremy Hicks from the Mercer Island Fire Department. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this one off, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna hand it off. How about that? So right. um, at long last, we are revisiting the um, amendments to the um, to the fire management plan that is an appendix within the 2003 Pioneer Park Forest Management Plan. And uh, just a reminder to trustees that this was last discussed at the January 2021 meeting. Uh, it's been quite a while. We apologize for the delay. Uh, and at that time, we brought you a redlined version of the 2003 original plan with a fair amount of updates to it. And then we also had a, a pretty robust discussion about potential changes um, to the force management section of the plan. So we are here tonight with a new version that's a, an updated version of the plan with additional edits. Um, tonight we have with us uh, Jeremy Hicks, who is the Mercer Island Fire Department's Fire Marshal. So thank you, Jeremy, for attending tonight. And then Lizzie is going to be talking about the um, the forest management portion of the plan and the changes that she's incorporated into this version also. Um, one thing that I, I do wanna note is that um, since the original revisions that were presented to the trustees last January, there was a change in leadership in the uh, Mercer Island Fire Department. And so we wanted to make sure to capture any changes that were um, suggested by the current uh, cohort at Mercer Island Fires. So um, we are very thankful to both Jeremy and to Deputy Fire Chief Doug McDonald for their help in the revisions. Um, and Jeremy is here tonight to answer any questions that come up. I know he's happy to answer any of those. And I think for right now, I'm going to turn it over to Lizzie because I know she'd like to run through some of the changes on the forest health portion of the plan. Hello, it's me again. Um, yeah, so I hope that you all have all had the chance to look over um, this updated document. Um, this was um, an interesting and pretty fun thing to update, honestly, because it's cool to learn about the way that um, fire interacts with ecosystems and especially in this urban wildland interface um, that we live in. Um, so in, in approaching this, um, vegetation management plan update, I, uh, I dug into a lot of research and um, publications that are out there and related to fire management in Western Washington and in our forests out here. And there's a fair amount of information available um, uh, through King Conservation District and Department of Natural Resources and Washington State University Extension. Um, because we are not the only city um, who is dealing with these questions and wanting to plan for potential fire events. So I was able to draw on the best management practices and recommended approaches that um, those that have already been developed in order to update this section. Um, so some main things to consider that um, maybe are sometimes a little misunderstood when thinking about fire managing a forest for fire. Um, like mitigating fire risk or fire severity um, is that we are in Western Washington where we have these moist, super productive, high biomass forests um, that, that we love and that's what they're known, we're known for. Um, and if we were to take these West side forests and aggressively thin them and mulch a lot of material and clear the understory to make them look like 
an east side forest, then we would be completely detrimentally altering the and destabilizing their ecosystem, right? So that's not an, a reasonable approach. That's not a management strategy that we can do without completely changing our forests. Also, it would be nearly impossible um, to maintain that cleared condition here. It's hard enough to maintain that on the east side. Um, we have plants here, invasive plants, namely blackberry, that can grow six feet in a year. Like we cannot maintain that cleared condition for any real in any real practical way and in compellingly the best available science shows that extensive aggressive thinning and clearing in western forests is actually unlikely to really prevent or, or mitigate the severity of the fires that we get here um, regardless so it, it, it hasn't even been proven to work over here um, for those two reasons that i just mentioned um, so with that in mind, um, the best approach is to, first of all, prevent fire ignition, like not let them start when the conditions are really dry um, and hot. Uh, and really anytime, let's not let um, ignition sources occur in our forests, but specifically when we've got really dry, hot summers, preventing ignition, also responding really quickly when we do see fire, which the first majority of this plan do talk about our ways of um, responding when we do see fire. Um, luckily, we're in an urban area that a lot of people are using these parks and there's a lot of eyes that can spot things when they do happen. So we're in a good situation there compared to a lot of wildlands. Um, and then as far as actual forest management, the best management practices are really to maintain a healthy, resilient forest ecosystem that can stand up against a disturbance and has healthy trees that are not going to just like burst into flames when when a fire event does occur. And then finally, um, to create a defensible space around our structures and buildings that we can actually, a space that's, that's manageable and that we can actually control and prevent um, immediate transfer of ember uh, or of tinder and fire moving through an, an ecosystem. So luckily we have the forest, the Pioneer Park Forest Management Plan and it already outlines a really solid approach for creating a healthy, ecosystem in Pioneer Park and Ingstrom. And so we're moving forward with that plan as we've been talking about, trying to make sure that we have healthy trees and that when we put in new trees, we're keeping them alive and keeping them robust and able to withstand our hot, dry summers. Um, and in addition to our forest management plan, we do want to um, think about that defensible space uh, around structures and people's um, built homes. Um, so that is sort of a shift in, um, while we are going to continue trying to keep our forests healthy and resilient in the, for the majority of the park, we do want to um, think about the borders where there are properties bordering it and um, so work with and support neighbors um, that to be able to ensure that they have an appropriately defensible space. So there are great resources available through King Conservation District and DNR and USDA's FireWise program that are built for homeowners and uh, part of our approach is going to be to reach out and educate, share these resources with neighboring um, property owners and um, help folks know how to maintain their own property um, to make your, your face, space as dispensable as possible. And then um, where the park is within that defensible zone of 30 feet within a structure, be able to, we'll work with landowners to be able to um, come up with a plan for managing that edge of the forest so that it can still be a part of a defensible space surrounding a structure. Um, there are a lot of different specific things like actions that are described in these various different resources that already exist. Um, and those will kind of need to be tailored to the specific situation. So there are um, many different materials out there that can help us navigate that, but basically that is the summary of our vegetation management plan is to keep our forests healthy as we can and um, make sure our, our spaces, our structures that we do want to um, invest in a particular amount of effort in are as defensible as possible. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, is there a specific plan for reaching out to the neighboring property owners? Is that going to be a direct mailing with uh, links to materials or um, is that still pending? That's not completely finalized yet. Um, that is what I was picturing is having a mailing of some kind. 
And then also making that those resources available on the city website so that folks maybe that don't necessarily border Pioneer Park can also access that information from Firewise program. That was my thought, yeah. That sounds good. Any other comments along those lines? Okay, thank you. And uh, was there a presentation from the, the fire department as well? Perhaps on the limitations of the, or how, how fire response would happen? Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, Jeremy Hicks, uh, your, your city fire marshal. Um, I didn't prepare a presentation. Um, I worked with the uh, staff on this report and uh, uh, hats off to Lizzie and, and her crew for the uh, the management, the fuels management section of that. Uh, the fire department side of it, we reviewed our capabilities and response standards and provided some information within the report for your review. And uh, I, I have to say after you know, 22 years in the fire service, this is probably the most uh, well put together fire plan I've seen and uh, really uh, commend all all the uh, members of the trust board and, and the staff for putting this together. It's, uh, it's well done. All right. I, I didn't quite catch. Did you have something you, you wanted to... Um present or you're just um, seconding the... I, I apologize for that. No, I have nothing to present. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't quite hear. I'm... So you heard... no. I also apologize for my camera being off. I'm on a mobile device and I think if uh, I turn my camera on, you'd probably be looking at my nose hair, which is uh, probably not that appealing to anybody. Okay. Thank you. Um, and there's a question on the floor from Jer Jerry Poor. Thanks. Um, I was hoping to understand in the vegetation management plan, Lizzie, if, if, I, if I may ask a question, um, when it says at the end, examples of recommendations um, are to remove dense patches of dead vegetation, uh, is that, what does that mean in the context of nurse logs and um, snags and that kind of thing that we actually are um, supporting? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I had a, I mean, this is something that people, these resources do talk about, um, but it's not as um, discussed. I did talk to a representative from the forest stewardship team at King Conservation District specifically about this. Um, in our West Side forests, having downed logs, um, they are generally pretty wet and they are not really considered a big fire risk. Those are not, um, having downed, downed wood that's decomposing on our forest floor is not um, something that is, is being removed in our west side forest. That's not a recommended practice. Um, same goes for snags, though I did hear from that um, King Conservation District representative that um, when there is a downed snag that's leaning against another tree, it can serve as a, as a ladder fuel that can go up into the canopy of that tree that mm. it's leaning against or on the roof of a building or something like that. So if you have dead wood in that context, then they do recommend to, to chop that up and down it. So in, in our defensible buffers, we will be doing that um, or suggesting that on people's properties. Uh, but otherwise, it, it's not something they actually recommend to remove in our forests. Okay, thank you. And uh, Marie had a question. You're, you're muted, Marie. Oops. Oh, Marie, you were not able to hear you. All right. Um, Let's come back. Unmuted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> this is related to Jerry's comment um, because one of the practices we've had in the past, um, like along the north uh, uh, border of the northwest quadrant, we placed a bunch of stuff along the border to prevent access to neighbors' backyards. It sounds like we we can continue doing that if what we're talking about is logs. 
Yeah, that okay. is that is not uh, removing downed logs is not a thing that they recommend doing. Okay, yeah, I am not worried about that. And and then the other thing is, and this is particularly relevant, I think, to Angstrom because there are actually two fire hydrants on the border of Angstrom, but there are no trails. I do know that the Forest Service pretty regularly just builds trails when they have to, when there's a fire. And I'm wondering if we have the equipment and the know-how to do that if we wanted to. Uh, Jeremy Hicks again, I, I can answer that. Absolutely, we have the, the equipment, the capability. We also have outsourced outside resources such as DNR and um, other neighboring fire departments that we would be able to call in to assist with us too. All right, well, that's reassuring. Okay, thank you. And uh, Hillary has a question. Uh, just real quick to um, piggyback on what Marie and Jerry were asking. Um, Elaine and Lizzie, when we do uh, debris rafts for stewardship, I know that that usually doesn't, you know, include downed wood or logs or anything. Is that still going to be a practice that we do, especially given that sometimes they get quite high? Uh, great question. Again, I, I specifically asked about that with a conversation with King County as well. Um, they did, did say that throughout our forest, having debris rafts is, is totally fine and an acceptable practice. Um, they did suggest that having piles of drying dead debris within the 30 foot defensible buffer of someone's home is not a recommended practice. So like if those are too close to the edge, we will, we will need to move those back. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think really highlighting that in this portion of the plan that it's really about managing those defensible spaces in, you know, in conjunction with those neighbors if they're interested in that, because that's really where we're able to make the biggest impact, right? So not necessarily in terms of how we're managing the forest beyond our, our normal management practices beyond that defensible space, but really looking at if there are things that can be done where the park overlaps with that that 30 feet radius, that 30 foot radius away from structures um, and homes along the park. Got it, so it's a, just a primary focus on the buffer zones. Right. Got it, thanks. Yeah, great question. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, is there any further discussion on the fire management plan review? In that case, I'd like a motion to accept the fire management plan. So moved. Thank you. I'll second. second. <laughs> Thanks, I heard a second. Yeah. Uh, so all those in favor, it looks like our video bandwidth has been, uh, been reduced. So I'm seeing only my own a video picture. So we'll dispense with the hand waving and simply uh, indicate by saying aye your approval of the plan. Aye. 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 And any uh, dissent? Hearing none, the plan is, the fire management plan is approved. Uh, so next we'll hear about the uh, trails work plan for 2022. And will that be uh, Andrew Prince giving the presentation? Yeah, yeah. Um, for the record, Andrew Prince, Trails and Urban Forestry Specialist. Let me share my screen. Okay, are you seeing uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, quick presentation on our trails plan for Pioneer Park uh, for 2022. Um, just to summarize what happened last year, uh, we did have a pretty big year in Pioneer Park last year, trying to make up for some lost ground in 2020 when we did not have seasonal staff. Uh, pictured here is our seasonal staff from last year. Um, 
they did some excellent work in here uh, doing a major resurfacing project on Pioneer Park Southeast perimeter trails and some interior trails. Uh, we did some kind of more corrective pruning in 2021 to um, make up ground on sort of the hack and slash approach we had to do to uh, trail brushing in 2020 just to, uh, to get it done in that year. We added some non-skid material to Ingstrom open space boardwalks and did some minor repairs on the ravine trail in um, Northeast. So quadrant by quadrant, looking at what we're trying to get done this year in Pioneer Park. We do have, um, I would say, a slightly reduced work plan compared to last year. Um, this is sort of normal for us to have an ebb and flow. Uh, we'll do a major project every couple of years in Pioneer Park and then do smaller projects um, in between those large projects. So. Uh, 2022, we're looking at um, more minor projects than last year, I would say, but uh, looking at the Northwest quadrant, um, getting some compacted gravel into uh, some of our widening muddy spots. Um, you know, this is a perpetual problem in Pioneer Park where we have uh, lots of trail without um, topography that we can turn water and uh, organic materials off of the trail. So we get ponding and um, widening of the trail as people try to avoid those muddy spots. So um, we have a volunteer event on the schedule with the Mercer Island mountain bike team. Um, they've recently approached us wanting to do some work. So uh, that will kick off our efforts on this uh, regraveling, um, and you know, hopefully, we'll be able to get them for another event or two if they want to continue. And then, uh, working with our new volunteer coordinator, um, hoping that this sort of project will be a good fit for um, doing some events throughout the summer. And then, additionally, having uh, putting some park staff time towards it. Um, as time allows. In the Northeast Quadrant and Engstrom Open Space, we're, uh, we have been already doing a little uh, getting started on this, um, which is um, adjusting the tread on some of our trail, uh, on some of these trails with very steep slides, uh, side slopes, our trail is getting turned to a, a in profile is getting turned to a very uh, aggressive um, grade. And we wanna turn that grade back and widen the trail. So it, it will still shed water and organic materials off the trail, but be wider and much more comfortable to walk um, and kind of keep that trail tread from migrating downhill. So uh, Ravine Trail, we're working in there on that we're replacing rotting stairs in the ravine trail and we're importing a little gravel and soil to um, cover up more mud and in Ingstrom open space. Um, speaking of our seasonal help, this is a photo of our seasonal staff this year. Uh, Ishmael on the left and Yin on the right. If you see them out there, please say hi. They've been doing great work so far. Um, and in the Southwest, we've been in here already working on our, our water bars. Um, these structures turn water and organics off the trail. A lot of them are rotten. So we're replacing them and doing some um, tread work in here as well to um, widen and improve that tread. Uh, so that is the presentation on the trails work plan. I do have some additional discussion uh, about, uh, there was some interest in hearing about potential for adding trail 
or, or rerouting trail in Pioneer Park. Um, I think maybe we can do that as a separate discussion after uh, the, the trust board has a chance to discuss the work plan, trails work plan. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. So at this point, um, are there any questions and comments related to the, uh, the trails work plan? And uh, please stop your sharing so we can see each other for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, I see, oh, let's see. Actually, I don't see any hands raised. So, uh, seeing that there's no discussion at this time, uh, let's uh, approve the, the trails work plan that we've, we've heard for this year. And move approval. Thank you. Oh, um, and I see, well, hold on. There's a, there's a raised hand from Gerald, Jerry Poor. Yeah, um, thanks, Tom. I would second it. And by just by way of discussion, I wonder if I could just ask one question of Andrew Prince. Um, you, in the Northeast Quadrant, you showed that uh, stair area where uh, you are doing work. My sense is that just farther down that slope is an area where the trail goes from north to east and there's a root cluster there which continues to erode over time and I wondered if you had an awareness of that and if it's on your list of things to watch and um, eventually um, it, it seems like a place you could get your foot twisted. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Geraldine. Um, uh, yeah, I'm aware of the area you're, you're talking about. Uh, I think you're right. It, the, the roots are becoming more and more exposed, uh, making it more difficult to walk. Um, the, I've, I've been keeping an eye on it. The tree is alive, so I don't want to be cutting any roots in there and um, haven't, yeah, we haven't taken any um, uh, management act actions to fix that yet but i think you're right it's worth putting on the list and and coming up with some solutions for thanks i i as i said i'd love to second the motion on the table all right um it is appropriate to hear discussion after the <laughs> motion is on the floor is there any further discussion on the the motion to accept this uh trails management plan All right, then let us move to the vote. Uh, indicate your approval by saying aye. 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 Any, it, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's move on to the, uh, the proposal for uh, the rerouting or addition of trails. So back to you, Andrew. Excellent. I will share my screen again and just to look at the map. And um, so forgive me, I'm forgetting which meeting uh, this was previously discussed at. I, it could have been your last meeting. I wasn't present. Um, it was, it but, was our, last, our last meeting. Okay. So the topic of, of adding some trail or, or potentially rerouting some trail uh, came up in that meeting, and I think there is a lot of uh, really great points raised about um, the impact of new trail on uh, the ecosystems and habitat we do have, and uh, you know, fract further fractioning that, breaking it off into little sections um, by you know, the human activity of of trail use. Um, I do have a, a few additional thoughts on the Pioneer Parks trail system. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's pretty good what we have, you know, it, it could use improvement, certainly. Um, so adding, I would say adding more trail does not necessarily make a, a, a better trail system on a whole. I think you'd want to 
do it very thoughtfully and very selectively if you did. Um, and once you start sort of picking it apart, it, it looks more like an entire trail redesign than it does, you know, a couple simple fixes here and there to, to make the system function better. Um, you know, we have some difficult terrain features in Pioneer Park. Uh, it's either very flat or very steep. Um, and it's hard to make sustainable trails on, on either of those uh, types of topography. So um, where it's very flat, there's, there's not a whole lot of rerouting to make our system um, more sustainable or increase access. I think, you know, we have a, a fair, fairly good amount of access, in my opinion. Um, I think the area where we might look at, you know, there's a potential to look at reroute would be south east quadrant, in my opinion, where we do have a more kind of gentle topography with a slope instead of you know, a ravine or flat. Um, one of the issues with the trails that are in here is, is many of them don't work with the topography we have, they, they go against it. So by that, I mean, they follow the fall line or, you know, charge straight up the hill or straight down the hill instead of contouring along. Um, so those trails are more difficult to maintain. Um, than you know, uh, uh, trails that work with the contour interval a bit. Uh, so, you know, is is a redesign possible in there? I think so. Um, you know, I I spent just a couple of hours uh, scribbling on a map, <laughs> and you know, you can start to see some potential in here. Uh, is this a good idea to start digging in and, and doing this work? I don't know. You know, I think what we have is pretty good. And if we started looking at something like this, it's, it's a major project to uh, figure out if it's, if it's even feasible, um, you know, um, the amount of staff input to do a redesign like that is something I, I don't think we have available right now. Um, personally, I, I'd love to do it. I think it'd be a, a super fun project, but um, balancing the staff availability with uh, other projects we have ongoing, um, you know, I think we'd, we'd need to contract it out or or add staff staff time to to really dig into um, looking at changing the layout of our of our trail system in Pioneer Park. So um, my understanding of the discussion last time was that um, you wanted some input from me on on my thoughts on that. So um, I guess any comments or reaction to that. All right, and if you could uh, pause your presentation, then we'll be able to, to see, or I'll be able to see raised hands. Um, well, I, actually, no specific proposal came forward out of the discussion uh, last time. So it seemed like uh, the consensus that we came up with as the board was that probably no changes uh, were immediately necessary. So as a little bit of background, I was responding to comments that were obtained from the community on the, the PROS plan. And one thing that bubbled up and caught my attention was that there were several respondents that indicated a desire for more trails, not specifically within Pioneer Park, but uh, many of the park users on the island uh, are out uh, walking or jogging or uh, walking their dogs. And so 
I think as a response to the encouragement to increase uh, interpersonal distance during the COVID pandemic, uh, people responded by saying they would like to have more linear feet of, of trail space available so that they would reduce their chances of, of encountering other people that were out for exercise. So that made good sense at the time. I think the, the need for that may be waning a bit. Uh, so, uh, it's possibly less of an issue, but the the responses from the community should uh, should be taken into account if possible. Um, but again, the consensus that we came up with uh, on the board was that um, we really didn't have, uh, or it was a lack of consensus to move forward. There, there was not a sufficient uh, motion to to actually uh, build new trails or or do that design. So unless I'm misinterpreting the intent of the board, uh, yeah, then the, the, I think we can just leave the idea. Um, from from my personal perspective, I would say that if there are changes to the trail system that that you observe would make the maintenance burden uh, less or Im improve the enjoyability of the, the trails, small small changes and keeping the, the design of the, the trail system more or less organic, um, I would be in favor of that. And that's, that's just speaking for myself, not for the board in general. So I'd like to hear other comments from the the board at this time, if they'd like to add to that. Yes, Marie. Um, so, I mean, Andrew, I, I guess just as a comment, if there's a quadrant of the park where I find myself sort of scratching my head, wondering where to go next, it is the southeast corner. Um, the trail systems in the Northeast and the Northwest just seem to work together better. Um, that doesn't mean I'm in favor of changing it. I'm really not. Um, but the question I have is in the fire management pr uh, plan, we have a to-do item that says we should develop a plan to improve trail access into the park for narrow vehicles and create access points where the trail system does not connect well with existing hydrants. Is that something you're thinking about? It's not in the current uh, trail management plan, which I probably is just a matter of timing as to what happened when, but is that on your list of things to think about for next year? And what would it entail? Um, currently, no, that's not, that's not on my radar. Um, you know, uh, I think from discussions I've heard and, and uh, I could be a little off base on this, that uh, my understanding from the resources we have, the fire resources is that they're not terribly worried about getting access. Um, they have uh, mutual aid agreements and plenty of hose. So I'm not certain that uh, that's still a big, a big driving, um, issue. I could be mistaken on that and that might, uh, we might need another perspective from someone who's more familiar with uh, the fire management plan. Thank you for, for noting that, Marie. I, I think in some ways that, that may possibly be a vestige that, uh, that could have probably been either toned down or eliminated now, okay. that, I, now that I hear it. In fact, I thought it was eliminated um, and I'm sorry that it wasn't, but yeah, um, Angie is correct about that. You know, in our discussions with the fire department, they were pretty clear that, you know, while this was a higher priority for past staff um, in the fire department, this is not currently a priority for them. They feel very comfortable with going overland with hose, whether or not there's a trail there. Um, they certainly don't need a trail. Uh, 
In fact, so much so that originally in the fire management plan, there was a map in there that showed trail access points. And they essentially told me that's not needed. It's not something we would ever use or, or really prioritize. Um, they go the quickest route from a hydrant to wherever the fire is, regardless of what's in their way. All right, we might uh, then clean up that document a little bit. Uh, I'll make a little note of that. Uh, okay, so um, are there any other comments about the design of the trail system or how it's working for, for people? Um, and Okay, um, I, I think as before, we, we're not making any specific proposal to, um, to make significant changes to the, the trail system as it, as it stands. And if there are proposals that staff wishes to make in the future, then we'd be happy to hear them. So with that, I think we can simply move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. So, uh, it's been nine years since the Pioneer Park Special Events Policy was created, and it's come up for review. So uh, who's presenting the, the um, Special Events Policy? Yeah, I'll, I'll be speaking on that. All right, Sam, thank you. Sam, Sam Harb, Parks Operations Manager. Um, I guess since the last couple of years in, in parks and recreation, we've been really ramping up our recreation side. And um, from almost very little or nothing in 2020 to getting new staff and new programming and um, special events, camps, things like that. And it's it a lot of events are on the on the calendar or, or being permitted and reviewed for this year. And that applies to Pioneer Park as well, um, where we're getting, we're starting to get requests and, and discussions about, um, you know, some special events and things. So I wanted to just kind of learn for myself as I started to read these policies and then bring it up to you all that we have this policy and at least last year, I don't know of many events going on that I was involved in permitting or anything, but um, we do have it for um, the public to hold events in Pioneer Park. And there are certain um, rules and um, criteria that they have to follow. And um, also if, if they fit within a certain criteria, then it, it does initiate us to review it and um, be able to permit them to, to do their event. So um, really, I, I just wanted to quickly um, update you on that, that we are, we, we do have a policy and I'm, I've been getting myself more familiar with it and we've been getting some, um, you know, outreach from, from groups to start utilizing Pioneer Park or hold events or portions of camps in there. And um, yeah, just wanted to, I guess, bring that up and, and share the document. I, I mean, I can, I, it, it's yeah, pretty are, straightforward. It's only a couple you, pages. Are you able to share the document? Yeah. Yeah, can you all see the screen? Not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Probably. Oh, here we go. Okay, you may need to increase the magnification slightly. All How's right. that? Good for me. 
Yeah, so as you mentioned, I think this was um, maybe around 2013 or around there that it was created. Um, it, it's, still, it's still pretty relevant. I feel like there, on, on the second page, there are some um, references to fees and potential staff time that might need to be updated. Um, I think kind of the main thing that I look at uh, is the, this section here that highlights the criteria for whether, um, for whether there, there needs to be a special event application. And so um, that is if the group size is more than 50 people, um, the event is timed or competitive, the event involves trail use other than walking. The group will occupy a fixed portion of the park for more than 10 minutes. Uh, if any participant may go off maintain trails or turf areas at any times. And then if the group will block any trail or inhibit safe passage of park use users. So um, any of those, um, if, if any of those things are, are going to be part of the event and that initiates the special event application and that's where staff would look at that and you know decide if we're going to permit that to happen there there could be there could be situations that we would just deem you know maybe destructive or, or just not really something that um, goes along with our trail use guidelines in the park to, that, that we would not permit, but um, that's kind of what we're looking at. And then um, going down, it's got a little bit of, I guess, uh, damage deposit type information. And, and if staff, if staff would be required or if, if staff support or, you know, any, anything, any support from staff, there'd be, fees associated with that on an hourly basis. So there's also some, some language down here um, related to sensitive areas in the properties and then, um, you know, restoration of damages that aren't covered in the damage deposit. Okay, let's uh, go back to the, the board. Is there, the, the, I think we have an opportunity here to revise the, um, these guidelines as, uh, as part of our review and the document has been in place for, for nine years now. Uh, and so it's appropriate that we bring it up to date. So uh, is there any discussion from the floor on particular items that we might uh, wish to adjust at this time. Yes, Carolyn. Yeah, so my just a, an information <laughs> for myself question. So uh, Sam, about how many of these sorts of events are uh, occurring right now in the open space areas? Very little right now. I mean, they're in, yeah. in Pioneer Park and Angstrom, there, there is a group that that um, has been doing some some activity in there, special event type activity, and they're and they've been very good to work with. Yeah. As far as wanting to be compliant and all this, they they haven't gone through the process, but um, that is something that they're open to doing and um, you know following the procedures for that. And then we do have. Um, an application for a uh, summer camp to, to use hmm. like one day a week, a few hours to uh, this summer to, to mm -hmm. do some usage there that would fall under the special event stuff. So it's been pretty minor so far, mm -hmm. but yeah, like I said, things are ramp ramping up. Uh, we have um, a, a big demand from the community for recreational programming and camps mm -hmm. and sure. Um, lots of things like that. So it's, it's just good to kind of 
be aware of this. And then do you have some sense of, um, you know, is there sort of a, a comfortable number that can be accommodated, accommodated number of events? I mean, is it, or do you feel like this is really just a, not a big issue and, you know, you've got a good handle on uh, how it's, how it's happening now? Yeah, I think it, it's hard to say whether there's a limit on, on events. I think sure. we, we look, we would just look at everything, um, individually and, and try to figure out the time that they're the day the time the sure. um the area you know whether it's in a more popular area like the northwest quadrant yeah. or a popular or an area where the horses are that might mm -hmm. have different implications and that might not mix well with with other use or it might require yeah. some planning with that group just to make everything flow so um yeah i mean I, I don't anticipate uh you know too many of these events or huh. um like uh over overrun with events or anything but yeah yeah, um, yeah. It, it's just good to look at everything kind of individually one at a time okay thanks uh, that just helps me understand it yeah Um, so, is the city of Mercer Island collecting fees against the use of the, the park, or is this basically free as long as there's no damage to the to the park property by the, the group? I mean, assuming that monitors are not required. Yeah. So, um, it it kind of it kind of depends because there there are some. Um, there are some groups that are like like summer camps that might be more of a city sponsored event where there's already kind of fees and stuff associated and then there are also um there they're usually there are, there are fees associated with special event permits um i i guess the only different ones or extra ones that relate to this permit process is just the established um the um hourly uh deposit damage deposit rate which is kind of uh its own special thing well i wanted to make a distinction between application fees versus usage fees um because mm -hmm. i i don't believe that we should be charging a fee to use the park um so application fees for a special event seems to be uh you know, that's, it's fine for the city to, to charge that, but I wouldn't want to see the, the city um, renting out, basically renting out the Pioneer Park. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good distinction. And um, I'd have to look closer at our, at kind of the, our recreation forms, but generally that is the idea is just the, the time it takes for staff to, look at these requests and approve them is um, part of the fees. All right, and I, I had another question, which is how would the, the review of this special event be triggered, um, thinking that a group might just come in and use the park as a park and not necessarily interact with the city before doing so. So it would be based on their awareness that there was a a maximum size of the group or there these other criteria that that triggered their need for submitting an application and then they would have to be self-policing is that pretty much how you see it yeah pretty much that's um and and that's been the case with with groups from time to time it just depends on if they're being proactive and contacting the city ahead of time to Find out what our policies are but as i said earlier there was there's been a group that didn't seem like they were aware of the policy and it seems like they um are eager to follow all the protocols now that they're aware of them so um it, it there there could be situations you know on weekends where we might not have staff that people could be doing unpermitted um, activities that do fall within this category and we don't really have a um, 
mechanism to enforce that in, unless we kind of are aware of it. I wanted to just add a little bit of context on this special event policy um, is that uh, in part, it was created in reaction to some recurring events that were happening in the park that, that did have some damages associated with them. And we found out about them incidentally. Um, it was a combination of some park users alerting park staff, but it was also that we were going to some websites to find out um, where their events were being advertised. And we found out they were being advertised in Pioneer Park. And then we were in contact with, with that group and, and it was recurring, right? So these things were happening um, periodically. And so I think that's, um, that's one of the types of events that we were trying to capture there was, uh, you know, particularly events that were off trail by design, which is something that we, we really try to dissuade people from and, and is memorialized in this, in this policy. Um, but also just large scale events, right? Anything that has just a, a tremendous amount of people, something promotional, something like that, that we wanted to be able to um, have a have a policy to yeah to document to. to refer back to yeah. yes yeah um, it's something that you mentioned just now that I don't see in the policy particularly is a, a recurring event, so we might want to consider. Um, putting a, a maximum recurrence frequency on on special events um, just to kind of prevent that habituation. Uh, so that's one issue that I would put forward for the for the discussion of the board. And another is um, I think that the lower bound of 50 people in the group might be too high and we might want to consider lowering that so um as a as a peg in the sand i would suggest lowering the minimum number of participants to 25. is there any support or discussion for that notion yeah i agree Jenny? with you yeah i agree too okay i hear three agreements so far um, how about we turn that into, oh, Mar Marie? I, I totally agree. Oh, okay. Um, well, let's, let's turn that into a motion then. Uh, so um, I, I would move that we lower the minimum group size from 50 to 25 in this document. And. I'll second. All right, I hear a second. And then all, of, all a, in favor? Uh, oh, um, I'm uh, sorry. I, a question? I should open it up for discussion uh, yeah. after it's been moved and seconded. Yes, Jerry. Yeah, I'd like to hear from staff what they think about that. And if uh, the only risk to doing this is, of course, that it creates more work that, um, that it's a trade-off with how much more work is required. So I'd like to hear from staff if that makes sense and if there is any threshold for the group sizes that you've seen over time. Or I mean, if there's sort of a, if 50 is normal or if 25, um, what the range of group sizes is that you see. Yeah, I don't have a lot of data to go off of um, in terms of different group sizes and everything, but I do know that the or I have heard that one of the groups that that has been operating in Pioneer Park um, has been relatively unnoticed so or at least from us and so um, it, it doesn't seem like there was too much of an impact and I'm not quite sure about their group size it might it's definitely not 50 it's I think it's probably on the smaller side but I also do want to point out that um, the requirements for for um, making an event subject to the special event application include um, any of those six requirements or any of those six criteria, um, which, you know, the first one is if it's more than, it, it's not all of them, basically. It's, it's, 
Yeah, it, any e one of those. Would either be of them. So even if it was a, a smaller group, presumably they, they would be doing, they, they could be initiating another portion of that that would still require them to go through this process. Um, I, I, I don't have much opinion either way, whether it's 25 or 50. Um, I, we would have to amend the, uh, if, if that decision was made, we would have to amend the, the table that um, has the damage deposit um, numbers of people, because that starts at 50. Yes. I will, um, I will chime in on Sam's, um, Sam's point here, which is that, you know, that was the reason why the criteria were laid out the way they were, was that um, 50 was the threshold, and partially it was because of administrative sort of burden when you have a group of 25, because that is certainly a consideration. Um, but looking at, you know, if a, if a group size is, say a group size is 40 people who are meeting up to do trail walking, right? That's a very different impact than 20 people meeting up for a timed or competitive event within the park that is more likely to have a damaging effect than 40 people going out walking on trails as, as a collective group. And so that's why there were, that's why those different thresholds were set up. We thought, well, if, if, um, what, what is, what is the amount of people where we could see, even if they were doing a low impact activity, where there could potentially start to be damages to the park. Um, and so that, that's where that trade-off was, is that we didn't need, we didn't want it to automatically trigger at a low number um, if it was a low impact activity, because that it seemed an unnecessary burden on both users and staff at that point, um, when the risk of damage to the park was still quite low. I see. Uh, Hillary, you had a comment? I did. This refers to the upper bound of the events. I see that the max here is 249. Was that by any chance in response to that pumpkin walk that used to be in the southwest during the wet season? And is that ever going to happen again in Pioneer Park? Oh, oh the northwest? Yeah. Oh, yeah, in the northwest. So if you'll recall, that event was moved to Luther Burbank Park. Uh, for many, many reasons, uh, uh, not least of which was safety. Um, mm -hmm. And so that uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't recall truly, I'm not just being coy. I don't recall if there was a, a nexus there <laughs> between that event and the creation of this special event policy, but, um, uh -huh. but certainly was a special event in Pioneer Park. Because that was several hundred people, if not more than that, right? I just remember being really astonished at what the collective impact must have been with all of those people winding blindly through the dark at night in the pouring rain. Yeah. So that's not ever coming back. I, I, can't, I can't say that for sure, okay. Hillary, but I will say that, um, that the city has been partnering with that group so that we can put it in a park that is more likely to be able to bear that burden of people. Great, thank you. All right, Carol, did you have something else to add? Carolyn? No. Okay, and Marie, you have your hand raised. I, I have a couple of comments and <clears throat> requests for explanation. Um, one of the criteria for whether or not you need um, a permit is item number five, which says any participant may go off maintain trails or turf areas at any time. Well, I mean, that describes anything. Um, any, any event, even one person walking in the park would trigger that <clears throat> um, criteria. And so I'm wondering a little bit about the background on that. Yeah, I can't really speak to the background, but I do acknowledge that that um, looking at that by itself is problematic. 
I think the I think the idea was to capture activities that necessitate going off off trail. So, for example, and this was one of the original considerations was the activity that is um, orienteering, uh, which is done you know, primarily with compasses. And so it's directly in contradiction to an activity that can be, um, you know, an on-trail use, right? Because it is by necessity cutting a straight line from one, one side to the other that doesn't necessarily follow, follow trails. So I believe that that's what that was meant to capture, um, not just someone stumbling off trail potentially. So that, that might be reworded to express the intent of going off trail. Yes, Marie, you had a further comment? No, actually, I, if that's the case, I would say that ought to be a per se, not, it can't be approved. I, I mean, I, I just, given the fact that we've pasted all over the park, don't go off the trails, I can't imagine giving a special use permit to somebody saying that they can. I, I think the, the idea isn't that anyone is guaranteed to get a special event permit, but they need to know what would trigger one. And I think what we'd like to avoid is people's seeing that their activity is expressly prohibited and therefore they bypass the special event policy. Um, so if we're able to put in here, we will, you know, this type of activity would trigger the use of this policy. Then they will be, then they will go through that process. But if we say this is expressly forbidden or for, for prohibited, then we just will bypass the city entirely. You're going to tell them that anyway. And so the second time they're going to bypass you. And if the lawyer in me would make the following argument. <laughs> This says the predicate of item one is the following criteria are used, uh, or A says, if any of the following are expected, then blah, blah, blah. So expected that you might go off trail. Okay, so that, that encompasses the thought that it's permitted. And then you go on later and saying, well, if you're gonna go off trail, we're gonna put monitors in place. But the purpose of a monitor is to make you stay on the trail. So I, I am very, I will just say for myself, I'm very uncomfortable with an, any statement that implies that it would be okay to go off trail. I know one of the considerations that came up, Marie, that I, I don't know that this will necessarily help this conversation, but one of the things that came up was um, and I think this applies to letterboxing to some degree also, mm -hmm. but I know that the orienteering groups were trying to figure out a way to continue to use the park. And so we were um, limiting where things could be put, how far off trail, you know, a, a, a geocache could be yeah. or a, a, a mark on a, you know, an orienteering course or something like that, which is where the, the monitoring came in was really, you know, we understand your, your activity necessitates some off-trail use, but we get to limit that to some degree. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, orienteering is normally both timed and competitive. So we would be caught with that item. I, I guess my recommendation would be to remove item five and leave it as part of the evaluation process if they put up their hand and say, I want to orienteer. <clears throat> well, um, I disagree, but I would change the language of item five to, uh, to specify that there's the intent that the users go, go off trail. And um, bearing in mind that just because a review of a certain activity is triggered, that doesn't mean that the review will come back with <clears throat> approval. So, um, right, but if you do it that way, you leave the implication that it might be approved. Yeah. And then you have to argue about why you were disapproved. <clears throat> As opposed well, to, if you, just that, take, if you just take it out, you leave it for the review process. Well, that, then with no the alternative, yes. But, so the alternative would be to, um, to put in the preamble that uh, events in 
in Pioneer Park and Engstrom open space are limited to the established trail areas and off use is prohibited, off trail use is prohibited at all times. Um, that, that's a reasonable approach. So you're saying delete five and amend the preamble? Yes. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. Okay. And uh, then we do have a question on the floor regarding the minimum number of people uh, at which the, the uh, review process is triggered. Uh, so the, the question is whether we should lower that to 25 or keep it at, at 50 as it is. So um, if there's, is there any further discussion on that question? I'll assume your raised hand isn't actually raised. Uh, raised. Well, actually, I guess I do have a reaction. I guess my question I, is, what are the sizes of the groups that are showing up now? Does 50 put us in a place where we will rarely get an application? So it's not, it doesn't matter or what's, what, what's the sort of normal? I think we already heard the response from Sam that um, it's fairly rare. Um, so he doesn't really have a lot of data on that. Okay. So I'm looking something up right now. All right. Anecdotally, I would say these events are quite rare. They're they are not. We aren't getting, you know, many applications each year. Now, certainly, the last couple of years have been quite different, and we don't know what the landscape is going to be for you know the demand in the next couple of years. Especially, like Sam said, as we're you know uh, seeing more sort of doubling down on outdoor re recreation. So. Yes, Joe, you had a comment? Oh, uh, I thought maybe I would say this while Sam was looking. It sounds like Sam just found it, but just quickly, the uh, time previously, I remember this coming, uh, a special event coming in front of us, um, Lane, was when there was a big group of forest specialists or forest, um, ah. there was a conference in town and people were coming to look at Pioneer Park and discuss the trees. And you were going to put down some plywood so that when they went off trail, it wasn't going to damage the plant. So this is the only experience I have with a policy coming in front of the board. Sounds like Craig remembers that too. So thank you. Okay, Sam, you had something for us. Yeah. So again, anecdotally, this is the first permit I've seen for this event, and it's a maximum of 24 is what they listed on their application. So. Um, and That's, what are they proposing to do? Uh, that one is a, is a bike camp. And, and how, I mean, part, I guess I'd like to have some sense of what causes the permit to be approved or not, a, and more importantly, what would be a disapproved? Because 25 bikes seems like a lot to me. Yeah, um, well, we would we would look at it and figure out where, were the, where they're gonna be or where they plan to be. We um, look at the other uh, trail use guidelines for Pioneer Park and see if they are gonna fall within that. And then also, um, I think typically it wouldn't be necessarily all 25 in one line. This is kind of a, younger age group, like a four to nine. And so they're probably gonna be in kind of smaller pods cruising around. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we would just have some dialogue and there's kind of a extensive application that they fill out different questions and things. All right, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jerry, you have your hand raised. Oh, okay. 
Um, <laughs> Let us return to the question then. Uh, shall we have the policy revised to uh, require groups of 25 or more to apply for a special use permit? That is the question. And uh, let's do a roll call vote on this so we can count accurately. So I'll just name off uh, in the order that I see on the screen. Craig? No. Okay. Marie? I'm sort of on the fence, but I, and it seems to me like staff is comfortable with 50, so I would leave it there. All right, Carol. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Maria. I think that if, uh, you know, there, this isn't causing an issue for now, um, I, I would leave it at 50. All right, Hillary. But express my concerns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, same here. I think, you know, if you're looking at, at the cost benefit of impact, how many events and what the nature of that impact is, that it, it doesn't seem cost effective necessarily to reduce it at this time. All right. Jerry? I'll go with the uh, end here and, um, and agree and not vote for this. All right. And Lisa, you're a voting member. Yeah, I would vote in favor of reducing it to 25 because I think it would, we can always bump it back up again, but because of the kind of dearth of data um, and the potential impact that you know, 25 or 30 people could have on the park, I think it would be good. I think it'd be good to monitor this and track this. Um, but th that's a lot of people. It's more than usually congregate in a group, I think, in, in the park or in the open spaces. So I, I'd actually vote in favor of the 25 and I'm obliged to vote in favor of my own motion. So I vote yes, that leaves it at two yay, five against. So the motion fails and that's where it sits. Um, there was also the suggestion that I made um, that we attempt to discourage recurring events. Uh, is there any discussion on that? Hearing none, let us move on. I think that concludes our discussion of the, um, the special events policy. And so the change that we've been, uh, that we've proposed that we'd like to see made is to remove uh, item five from uh, section one and instead uh, stress the preamble that off trail use of the Pioneer Park and open space during an event is prohibited. So um, we'll leave it to staff to make those revisions. Would you like us, first, I guess the question is, would you like to make a formal motion on that change to the policy because it is a policy change? And the second question is, would you like to leave the, the amendments to staff, or would you like us to bring it back at the next meeting for a final uh, for a final vote? Uh, I think we can handle that with a motion right now. Uh, Marie, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I just would modify the thought a little bit because I am sympathetic to scientists being in the park, and if the solution to scientists being in the park is to put down some plywood so they can see a tree, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so you might want to predicate it on, except in rare circumstances, it's not it's not permitted. Or um, for educational, scientific, or or forest health. Something, yeah, something that that would permit yeah. the forest and you know scientists to come and look at it. Okay, then perhaps we should uh, review <laughs> a revised policy after the the language has been pro proposed. So um, in that case, we don't need a motion at this time. I think we'll just direct staff to uh, change the wording and bring it back to us. Does that sound okay? Sounds good. All right. In that case, we can move on to the sixth item on our agenda, the letterboxing update. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sam Harb, Parks Operations Manager. Um, this is just a real quick update. 
last year we didn't, or last time this was discussed in the meeting, I don't think there was an update. It, there wasn't staff to um, support this. The update I do have uh, along with, you know, as I mentioned, rec uh, staffing being brought back and getting hired up. We, we do have some, some people that can do some work on this. And we also have a lot of volunteers that are interested. And there are a few people in the rec department that are um, looking to take this on this summer and um, get going on this program again. So that's my brief update for that. And um, I'll know more later as those things are ironed out. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so we've come to the end of our uh, numbered agenda. So let us move on to quadrant reports. Let's uh, hear from the Northwest Quadrant first. Greg, you wanna go? Sure. <laughs> well, I, I'm thrilled that uh, the uh, mountain bikers are gonna jump in and do an event to take care of some of the muddy spots. I was out there on Monday and in a, over an hour, I was, I never saw another person and there were no cars on 84th and I don't think that's ever happened before. It was raining pretty hard. Um, so there was some mud uh, here and there, but uh, I think this is a really great approach using volunteers like the mountain bike club at the high school to uh, come in and lend a helping hand. So I'm, and I'm very excited about the volunteer coordinator uh, for the, for the summer. That's, that's a great uh, idea to hire somebody to take care of that. Um, hey, one question I had was if there's any uh, plan to update some of the, um, I don't know what you call those, the display boards uh, in the Northwest Quadrant, they're, they're pretty beat up and the, the plexiglass is cracked. And um, I, I, I just, uh, just kind of noticed that uh, every time I'm out there and I, I've never mentioned anything, but they're, they're looking pretty sad. <laughs> and uh, so maybe at some point, uh, we should take a look and see if they need updating or if there's a plan or something like that anyway. And then um, uh, the parking restriction uh, on uh, 84th really worked out well. Uh, I never see anybody driving up on the curb. Well, they try, <laughs> but uh, with the little ropes and um, and metal bars have, have done the, the trick. And I think it's been a big success. And I'm looking forward to that uh, continuing on. And then there was a click it and fix it request. Somebody said there was a dangerous tree uh, in the middle of the park and I, I never followed up on it. Either. But there's lots of trees that, that are snags that look not so great. Not, I was just wondering if anybody could provide any follow up on that click it or fix it request. But otherwise, that's it. Um, I'll follow on uh, with a yay for letterboxing. Thanks. Good to hear that, Sam. Thank you. Um, and just two other things playing off of what Craig said. It, my sense is that those display setups were put in by an Eagle Scout at one point. And so <laughs> I wonder if there are any junior scouts who want to come <laughs> along with a bucket of water of, kind of appropriate soap that would clean them up. But at the can, I, can I give you some info on that really quick? We do actually have some, I believe some duplicate copies of those mm -hmm. in one of our offices. So in the meantime of trying to figure out maybe if they could be updated or removed entirely, there's a possibility we could also just put in the, uh, the other copies and new plexiglass to buy some time so they don't look so um, worn down. That sounds good. Uh, I would like to just bring up one last issue that perhaps staff could come back at our next meeting. I, when I'm out in the Northwest Quadrant and going back south uh, at the crosswalk at 84th, so from Pioneer Park to uh, Pete's Chevron Station. Um, 
sometimes I know you have to get right up to the edge for the cars to see you. And a lot of time the cars ah. are headed west or south and they don't even look to their right. And uh, the traffic side of me was wondering if the city could look at that and see if they there could be some um, pruning of the shrubbery to make that a more visible location for pedestrians to wait. Yeah, it's right next to the crosswalk, isn't it? At the crosswalk, right. People just don't pay attention. Yeah, so not in the park, but actually on the, the QOC. On the right of way? No. Oh. Oh. Well, so I meant on the, the, on the north side, but it's probably oh. public right away at that point. Would be great to know if there's something that could be done. And that's my, that's the end of my report. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we, can, thank we can look at that. Yeah. Or use that. All right. Um, so moving on to the Northeast quadrant. Do you have a report, Hillary? I think you're on that one. Um, I'd say it was really looking good. You know, I think you can tell, even though, you know, um, we've had so many storms this past year, I think that Andy and his crew have been so on top of it. And it's really evident how much work has gone into making those trails continue to be passable. Um, and I think it's, it's looking great. And I was in the Southeast and the Northwest recently with Marie and Carolyn. And uh, we were just, we actually saw the seasonal crew that was working on those. Um, I can't remember what they were called, but the those water things. Yeah, the, the water things. Water thing. <laughs> yes. Um, and so it was very exciting to see that work being done. And then mm -hmm. in the Northeast and then the Southeast, the continued work on the ivy rings was really inspiring because it so desperately needs to come off the trees. So we're excited about that. Yes, um, I was out yesterday with, with my dogs and on leashes, of course, and they, uh, well, uh, I noticed the new treads that were put on the, the bridges that go over the seeps in the Engstrom open space, and that was yeah. very nice. Yeah. And also some of the repair work that's been done on the stairways and the ravine trail. Yeah. And uh, the, the trails, as usual, are nice and clear of uh, a brush, even after the the recent windstorms. So uh, that's an impressive job that's, that's being done, keeping the, the trails clean all the time. Um, and in the southwest or southeast quadrant, I noticed that um, the water bars have some new water bars have been installed. So that's moving along nicely. Uh, so now let's move on to the southeast quadrant. You're not going to go, Carol. <laughs> um, so I was last out, I guess it was two weeks ago. So we've had a pretty good windstorm since then, but it was yeah. looking really good then. <laughs> um, and yes, it was really nice to see the crew out fixing the water bars. Yeah. And we did stop and chat with them. So that's always a nice thing to do. Um, you know, I wanted to mention this, since you brought it up, Jerry, the um, the, the visibility issues. I actually, when I'm driving our truck, I'm fine because I'm up high. When I'm driving my car that's low to the ground, as I'm turning from Island Crest onto, I guess it's 68th, it is very difficult to see anybody coming out of that corner because of the shrubbery that's there. I mean, it would just, it's just hard. It's there's too much. There's a, there's enough obstruction that, yeah. I mean, I'm very careful going around because I'm mindful of it. But other people wouldn't um, wouldn't necessarily recognize it. So I, I guess I would like to if we're going to look at things, we have to look at that as well. Because I think a lot of times people don't realize that cars that are low to the ground have different visibility than an ordinary sedan or a truck. Um, and on the volunteer program, we're not going to meet again until July. I would really like to be kept apprised of how the volunteer program develops. Yeah. Um, so if there's any way to informally communicate with us, I'd, I'd really be appreciative. Absolutely. I, I think our, it would be nice if we could be included. 
exactly. Yeah. Well, that was my up. thought. If I know yeah. about it, I can volunteer. <laughs> Yeah, I had signed up for a couple of those events and, um, you know, they were canceled, and, you know, for a right. number of reasons during the COVID shutdown. And, you know, now there hasn't been anything and it would be really, really nice to be involved in some of those activities. We'll make sure to CC the entire uh, trust board. And Thank you. Yes. Go out. Uh, did you have any uh, further reports? Carolyn yeah, and I would just say I'm on the northeast side too, and it's oh. very obvious when I go there that uh, there's just intense activity going on. Uh, it just gets better every time. Um, you know, my grandson and I go out there regularly. He has noticed that, you know, there's several dead trees <coughs> against live trees, and he's very worried about those live trees. So um, if those are fired hazards, <laughs> I know there's a couple of them back in there. Um, but um, boy, the, the trail down to the ravine is much better. Yeah, obviously there's still, the root issue is still needs uh, addressing, but um, boy, it's just so much better. It really is. Okay, I assume that concludes our quadrant reports. Is there any new business to be brought before the board that anyone wishes to bring up this time? That would go on the agenda for next meeting. Okay, hearing none, our next schedule, our next meeting is scheduled for the 21st of July. And I assume at this time that there's no further business to be brought before the board in this meeting. Hey, Tom. Uh, yes. I just have one quick announcement at the request of the city clerk. All right. Um, I just wanted to share that we have um, annual recruitments for city boards and commissions that are open now through May 4th. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please spread the word. Okay, I think we've come to the end of it. So uh, I'd like a motion to adjourn. So move. Thank you. And a second. Seconded. <laughs> Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very well. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bye, everybody. everybody. Good night.